Hello, welcome. I'm Dolores Fortuna, and this is for art's sake. Well, welcome to the 2013-14 uh, Parkland uh, Ceramic Biennial, and it's called A State of Art, of Contemporary Art, and uh, my name is Dolores Fortuna, and I am the curator for the show, this year's show. Uh, I wanted to start with Don Pilcher, because he kind of epitomizes um, the theme for the show and the concept for the show, which is to um, highlight artists who are risk takers and who have use their craft to really push forward ideas and to challenge the ways that they problem solve and um, um, also move their work forward. So Don is uh, a very iconic clay artist. He became well known in the 80s uh, for his work in vessel making. He was a professor for, I think, 30 years at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana and was a major influence in the direction of clay in the 80s and 90s. Uh, he took a hiatus of 12 years um, He's uh, and reemerged about eight or nine years ago with a completely different body of work, which was totally fascinating in um, the reinvention. And coupled with that emergence, was writing. So he um, would say that the body of work that he's now doing really embraces uh, more, um, a lot of aspects of how he uh, interacts with the world and the uh, clay making skills and technical knowledge that he gained from his earlier career, he kind of really embodies in his new pieces. So the writing is really important, as is the visual um, uh, presentation of these ideas. It's called Rascal Wear. There's a website for it. Uh, there's 12 chapters. Each one of the chapters um, um, uh, kind of explores a topic. So you're welcome to delve further into this um, body of work by, you know, uh, going to the website and uh, uh, going on to Rascal Wear. The other thing also that in this show, and Don uh, Pilcher also signifies it, is how important the catalog is for this show. We asked artists to submit images of their um, previous work or work that they were well known for or where the work that they used when they established their careers but also to write a, a more personal statement about uh, what motivated them to change their work. Um, and so please um, access the catalog to kind of, um, uh, you know, delve farther into artists that you find interesting. Um, this is contrast with Mary Berenger. She's a uh, East Coast artist. I think she lives in Vermont. She um, describes herself as a very, very slow maker and she does hand-built slab work, um, fires and oxidation, and one of the, of the aspects of her, her work that I've always found really engaging are her surfaces. And so she works very meticulously, works back and forth. So we have, again, a range of work here, and the subtle, and the shift is more subtle in her work. And so I think we can have uh, artists that shift dramatically and artists that shift subtly. And so in the gallery uh, installation, which I really thank uh, Louise for, is almost uh, contrasting these kind of, of uh, change, but change which you know can be, again, very dramatic or very subtle. Her work has a sculptural feeling and, again, has a real strong form consciousness that I think uh, especially as you walk around her work, you start to see the relationships between the pieces that she's playing with, and uh, also just the color values uh, throughout the forms. Uh, another artist that I chose who I've followed since he was a grad student in Minneapolis is Sam Chung. And um, this body of work, um, uh, 
kind of um, uh, really goes with the images of clouds. And his earlier work, the pieces were more frontal. His concern is usually uh, working through vessel forms. And the body of work that he's showing here has kind of stayed with those themes. The work is much um, more rotational and he's incorporated more information from his Korean background. And he uses um, kind of, again, that ima the imagery of clouds is significant to him culturally. And so this is a teapot, again, and, and the line element besides just the forms is what he's really has, one of the changes that's the difference in articulation. One thing I really like about his work, Sam's work, is the subtlety. So this piece, you can read it as, again, a cloud jar. And in Asian culture, there are jars, there are moon jars, there are jars that relate to uh, physical aspects. And what is really so powerful here is that the reference to his classical heritage is just very subtle. Both, this is a very classical foot, this is a very classical ending to this bottle. It wouldn't have to be there, but because it is there, he's kind of challenging us to start to make some references outside just the beauty of the form. So again, very subtle work. Like Mary, he's a very slow and meticulous craftsman. So one thing that's really wonderful about the show is to just enjoy the high quality of craft that of, of the actual pieces that you um, don't totally get from just seeing the images. So again, I think, especially in the teapot, it's just really a pleasure to look at because it's so well crafted. Uh, what I want to do now is swing over to another artist. This is um, Sean O'Connell. And again, the show is really, really enjoyable to me because with all the people in the show, I've followed their careers. Some of them I know personally. Some of them I've just really enjoyed their work over a long period of time. And so part of the pleasure of curating a show is to put together people that you see something and you enjoy their work. So it, it, that's part of the pleasure. His work is, um, I met Sean when he was just done with his undergrad studies and he was teaching at art and art center in Chicago. And he is someone who's always had a passion for clay. Like Don, he started to do clay when he was in grade school and has a lot of technical expertise and ability and worked so hard to get into grad school. And so he asked me uh, when he was applying to grad school to review his slides and to give him comments. So he, again, is, um, has a passion for clay and just knew that's what he wanted to do since childhood. Uh, so, and I think he kind of alludes to that in his artist statement. His work really evolved in grad school. He's about five years out of, out of school. He went to grad school in Rochester and studied with Richard Hirsch, who is another one of our iconic artists. Um, his work became much more uh, fluid and generous. Um, and really developed surface statement. So his other, his previous work before going to grad school was just really about the form and applying glazes that were just other people's glazes. And so in grad school, he really developed his surfaces, uh, kind of freely admits that he enjoys decorating. And uh, uh, so a lot of this work is, is fairly complex with slip inlay and glazes that kind of flow and pull. And these pieces also are just really, really wonderful for the kind of generous forms that they have, but also these really wet fluid surfaces that flow. I'd like to introduce Julia Galloway's work. Um, she moved to Montana about three years ago and was teaching at RIT where Sean O'Connell received his uh, graduate degree and she was his teacher. So I think it's um, really fascinating in the clay world to um, 
have to work with students, I teach at the, at, um, the Art Institute in Chicago, to really uh, have them reach further into themselves and to, you know, to offer them a lot of options that to further develop their work. So you can see some tie-in and I think it'll be really interesting to see Sean's work in another five years because I think he's still digesting the wealth of information from his grad school experience. So she, her work is very strongly vessel-based, especially vessels that people live with and enjoy. Um, she's a maker of uh, objects that often have relationships between their parts. So she really enjoys making sets, like a teapot would have a uh, receiving plate as a, a, a cream and sugar set. There's an elegance to her work, and also she uses a kind of inlaid slip and soda fires. So in her surfaces, you see this kind of really wonderful, soft kind of drifting quality. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about a lot of the artists and their statements is they talk about the importance of place in their work. And for her, um, the physical living in the East Coast was, was very different than, to her experience in living in Montana. And she talks about that feeling of the big sky. So uh, like Sam Chung, but in a different way, she's really interested in articulating this um, feeling of space and clouds and just really large exposed landscapes. Uh, we're Midwesterners, and so I think we also, and I teach in Chicago, and I have a lot of students that also talk about moving, let's say, from a rural environment into the city and how, uh, especially if they haven't lived in a large city before, how that impacts their consciousness of space, of time, of, of relationship between objects. Um, so I think uh, it was really fascinating to me that that's one thing that she really spoke to in her artist statement. She's just a beautiful maker. Her forms are, are exquisite. And again, the cups also kind of talk to the fact that she really works when she, uh, in series, and really often talks about the relationship of an idea and how it kind of flows through the cups. So those are really a beautiful, almost panorama of a sky. And they're really meant to be enjoyed collectively. And also the little, uh, almost like your shape with the tray. So uh, I've uh, been a long admirer of her work, both her craftsmanship and, and the way she explores her ideas. Richard Hirsch is our next artist. And I have, in my teaching career, referred to him many, many times to my students. He, um, in the catalog, he has a picture of a tripod. Uh, and he was really well known for that series of work and did it for probably about 25 years. Um, and then about 10 years ago, his work radically shifted and he was no longer showing the tripod series. And the tripod series has a lot of references to um, art of the, of the Americas. And that's a, the conical leg form is a, a form that's referred to a lot in, in traditional art. And uh, when I saw this first series, I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? And I was really, and I knew that in the tripod series, there was a lot of uh, icon iconographic kind of knowledge. There were a lot of references to culture, to myth. And it took me a while to really fully understand that these pieces were also talking about the same sources, but we're just exploring them. And in some ways, the elements that these are composed of are almost more literal. And Richard has a book that's coming out, I think, as we speak, that he kind of deciphers some of these forms for us. This is really a beautiful one. His surfaces are really exquisite and really kind of speak to the depth of knowledge that he has acquired in his uh, long career in clay. So again, very, very um, uh, enjoyable 
as just physical objects, but also to kind of really start to understand the meaning and the content through the forms that are represented. Um, one thing that is interesting, and some artists will refer to this in their gallery statement, is a lot of artists establish a long term relationship with the gallery. And the gallery that shows their work is very important in terms of um, giving them direction, advice, etc. And about two years ago at NSICA, which is the National Conference for Ceramic Artists, I had the pleasure of going to dinner with Richard. And I was very bold and I said, how come you changed your work so radically? What was going on? And he said, well, it was, again, like Don, he just felt that he had kind of come to an end point with that other series. There was nothing more that he could say about it. He had done as many iterations of that work as he could possibly do. And had a hunger to um, kind of just approach a new body of work. But he said he had received a lot of pressure from his gallery not to do that because they could sell as many of the tripod pieces as he could do. So I think both he and um, Don really speak to um, that kind of bravery to say, yes, I'm really going to listen to uh, what my inner voice is telling me to do. And, I, and we're so glad that he did because he brought this great work forward. And uh, we can really enjoy its complexity. This is a foundations class. This is kind of the gateway class. Drawing is applicable to anything that you do within art and design. It's about visual language. It's about learning how to think visually and communicate visually. When you draw, you take the three-dimensional world and you translate it onto a two-dimensional page. Uh, and so you're creating the illusion, the magic, uh, of a three-dimensional form on a flat surface. And that's, that's the main thing that drawing one is about. And it takes some time. Uh, to learn that. It's really nice like when you learn the techniques and how to apply those into actual application and the output is amazing. Anybody can take classes, anybody can draw. If you have that passion, if you feel like doing it, just go for it. In drawing too, there are more issues of content uh, and we do go into color pretty quickly and it's um, a lot more individuality. The artist can come out and Again, it's the exploration of technique. She really pushes you to go outside the box or try things that you wouldn't normally do on your own. I found that the professors here are really interested in the students and take the time out with them, and they don't try to push their style of art on you. They just try to refine your own skills, and they want you to keep you know, your twist on it. This class is a little bit more um express it. I mean individual wise you can express yourself a little bit more and everybody has their own little style so it's a little bit more laid back. Drawing one focuses very much on structure and how to view the world as in like in a very realistic way. We get to play with just all sorts of mediums and papers. It's fun. It's time consuming but it's very worth it if you really love to do it. It's a teaching focused place, so you're going to get personal attention uh, more so than you will uh, at other uh, institutions, and I think that's the advantage. We combine classes for painting one and painting two and hope that we get some of the experience for people from painting two to rub off on painting one students. It kind of helps them out, I think, with stretching canvas and preparing surfaces and just talking about color. You don't only learn about painting, but you learn about drawing, you learn about color, you learn about shape, you learn about everything, and it's really fun. 
It's been great. I've really enjoyed taking classes with Steve. Even though it's a beginning level class, he lets us be really creative. I like uh, the class to function as a group, and I, I want even the, the beginning students to confront uh, the painting in an advanced way. And it's a really nice class because you can learn from all the other students around. Parkland's really great because there's a lot of people that painted for a long time that, that take the class for fun so you can learn from them. The uh, energy goes both ways. You know, that's the students uh, that have painted before see the, the ingenuity of the younger students and, and uh, vice versa. So it's a really good, uh, it's actually a good uh, scenario. Color really and what paint can do are the two things I want them to pull out of this class. And if I didn't mention independence, I'll mention that again. Independence is something that I really want them to have, that they can come out of here feeling that they have many different approaches to how to approach paint. We have um, another artist that I'd like to speak to and her name is Marion Kaufman, and also a person that I have really long admired. She is German and studied in Germany and then came to the United States and got her master's degree maybe about 10, 12 years ago from, uh, from Minnesota. Her work is visually uh, different in the context of the artist because her form sources are um, European postmodernism. So she would say that her form sources are uh, very sculptural, like Brancusi. Um, and for clay working, she would go back to Hans Koper and uh, Ruth Duckworth, British potters from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, the series of work that she wanted to contrast were her vessel pieces, and um, recently what she did is, is uh, shifted her studio practice to just wall installations. Um, so again, they're um, constructed um, slab forms that come out from the wall and again have that kind of um, form consciousness, they're very, very subtle in both glaze and surface articulation. Um, and important in her work, I think, is that sense of shadow and how they play against the space. And uh, the installation here is just really wonderful because um, especially when I walked into the room, I really enjoyed how these uh, three-dimensional forms really kind of worked with the pieces on the wall. So I think if you have a chance to come to the gallery and just really enjoy these in the space, uh, that will kind of complete uh, a more and give you a more fully uh, experience of how these objects are working. There's also really a wonderful piece that's kind of uh, uh, highlighted against the wall over here, which I think, again, really um, has so much space around it uh, and it has a lot of the very subtle relationships and how the edges and the lines work. And again, the cast shadow, uh, the isolation works. It just is really interesting how such a simple form can really hold that wall. So I think that's why gallery visits are really, really important. And again, uh, walking through the show, it's just a pleasure to, you know, kind of almost like walking through a, a garden to see the, you know, to see these pieces in their places. I'd like to um, talk about my dear friend uh, Bill Farrell's work. Um, on the wall we have a sculptural piece. He also had, has had a very, very long career in clay. Um, and his life story is pretty interesting. He came into clay very in accidentally because he was a, a high school art teacher and uh, had to do a clay class and, and spent the summer and I think at uh, Alfred learning how to work on the wheel. And so again, like all of us, it's that kind of incidental experience that all of a sudden grabs hold of us and it becomes a lifelong career and passion. 
some people that happened very early, like Sean and O'Connell and Don, and some of us it was just something that, you know, we had to do for a job, or and all of a sudden it was like, yes, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Bill's work was very, very important in um, taking clay as a material outside of just vessel making in the 80s and 90s. And what he did is pushed material exploration and just the whole concept of what is clay. How do you work with it? How do you put surfaces on it? And so he did a lot with raw clay and latex, with, and these also are uh, extruded uh, clay uh, tubes that are then um, um, put into kind of a, a language. And so he's talking about that flow of form and form becoming language. And uh, a lot of his idea references and sources come from other passions that he has, which are motorcycles and bicycles and cars. So he derives again, so the tubes you can start to see as um, exhaust pipes on a motorcycle, if you wanted to make a kind of a very literal reference. There's also a kind of a bravery because he has an eroticism about his work that I think he's um, very, um, you know, not apologetic for it all because he kind of sees that in some of his, his elements. These are covered with black latex and he sees that as a very legitimate surface for clay. So again, um, it's really uh, worth it to go farther into his career. He's got some other images of work in the catalog that are in the show. And he's another artist who, again, has really been very important in opening up how uh, we talk about clay, how we work with clay, and again, has had some really, uh, done some significant work in his past. About 10 years ago, he moved to Galena and built a wood kiln and had not really been a vessel maker or a potter, shall we say, for many years. And he started making tea bowls. And he would see these as equal in concentration, focus, and intent as his sculptural pieces. He uh, spends a lot of time with each of these, uh, adding marks, uh, d making decisions about the foot, the rim, the undercut, the shadow. So as you look at these, they're incredibly enjoyable just for, again, the information, the marking, almost again, the language, uh, like this is a language. He would see that he's almost putting a narrative of marking into these pieces. They're wood fired. Many artists love wood firing because the way it subtly embraces the form and enhances the marking. So all, each of them are different and when you wood fire, each piece is always going to be different. So that again adds to the, really the kind of the specialness of, of his work. So uh, again, really a great um, visual experience and just it's fun to be in the presence of uh, the work of so many fine artists. So thank you. Thank you.